tonight on Primetime Politics. Inflation uh, is a huge challenge for so many families. The September number is in and inflation remains stubbornly high. What are the reasons? How will the Bank of Canada respond? We'll examine the issue. Also, the right of workers to bargain for better wages is now more important than ever. Banning the use of replacement workers. We'll speak to the Labour Minister about a consultation process that's just been announced, but when will a bill make it to the House? And... They cared for us deeply. We love you too, Dad. Praise for a parliamentary great. Politicians from both sides of the House pay tribute to the late Bill Blakey. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. The Bank of Canada has raised its benchmark interest rate five times this year, but inflation remains stubbornly high. The latest number coming out earlier this morning, 6.9% for the month of September, barely a budge from the month before. The higher cost of everything is hurting many Canadians as they try to make ends meet. Take a listen to what the Prime Minister had to say about it earlier today. We know that inflation uh, is a huge challenge for so many families. The rising cost of food, the rising pressures on family budgets is hurting everyone. I've heard it from coast to coast to coast as I've spoken with families. That's why it was a good thing uh, that we were able to get to royal assent, pass unanimously uh, measures, our measures that will uh, give a greater uh, GST credit rebate uh, to 11 million households in the coming weeks. That'll make a difference. We also know that the lowest income families who struggle to be able to send their kids uh, to the dentist uh, or uh, low income uh, renters who need a little extra support will benefit greatly from uh, the bill we have for it in the House right now. This is why we're asking for the Conservatives to not only stop blocking it, but actually support it. Now, the measures Prime Minister Trudeau outlined are targeted measures and will arguably help lower-income families more. But whether you qualify or don't, the question remains the same. When will things get back to what was, if ever? To discuss the matter, we're now reaching out to Trevor Toome, who is a professor of economics at the University of Calgary, and economist Soheb Sahid, who is also the director for economic innovation at the Conference Board of Canada. Welcome to the two of you. So Trevor, I'll get you to start us out here, because while today's inflation number has only gone down slightly, you've said that it is evidence that things are returning to normal. Explain that for us. That's right. So inflation is usually quoted as a year-over-year comparison of consumer prices. So September of this year compared to September of last year. And that means it's accumulating all of the changes over the past 12 months, and so it can take time for new developments to affect that headline number. But if you zoom in and just look at the last, say, three months, those price changes in July, August, and September are equivalent to an annualized 2.4% rate of inflation. Or if you look at the past four months, it's just a little over 3%. Annualized. So it does look like since the summer and in these recent months that the overall pace of price increases month to month has returned closer to normal than we saw earlier this year. Okay, so you have to go beyond the headline number. And so, hey, I'll get you to weigh in because, you know, based on the headline number, 6.9% compared to last month, 7%, it doesn't seem to be that much of a change on the surface. Well, that's right, Michael. And if you look at today's release, you know, we find out that the inflation has now been coming down for three months. And a lot of this is because of global factors like supply chain disruptions easing and global commodity prices also coming down. Now, while all of that is good news, we also need to keep in mind that core inflation, which is CPI inflation minus food and energy, that actually went up last month. We also need to keep in mind that you know lower inflation doesn't necessarily mean lower prices. It simply means the growth rate of prices is coming down. So consumers would still be hurting a lot. And if you dig deeper into you know today's release, you see that inflation is not coming down across the board. And if you look at uh, mortgage interest interest costs, you know, they're going up. You know rents are going up. So even though house prices are going down thanks to Bank of Canada's interest rate increases housing is not necessarily becoming more affordable for the average Canadian. And in all of this, it's still really the low-income Canadian who is being, being hit the hardest. And this is because, you know, they tend to spend more on things like food as part of, part of their annual uh, expenditure. 
and food prices are still going up. In fact, grocery prices went up at the highest rate uh, last month in more than 40 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and I think that's a good question, Trevor, because you know when you uh, look at the most basic of needs like groceries, as Sohei uh, outlines there, it's still stubbornly high. Why is that? Yeah, so that is a very important point that just more generally means that inflation, the price changes that we're seeing, affect different people in different ways. And so if we look at lower income households, I estimate the September uh, report is equivalent to an 8.4% hit to disposable income for the bottom 20% income households, compared to just only uh, a 4% hit to the top 20% income of households. So why food prices have continued to uh, increase or increased in September? There's a lot of factors there uh, and different products will be affected differently, but importantly, the Canadian dollar has fallen through September about 5% or so over the course of the month. And roughly two thirds of our fruit and vegetables are imported. So when the value of the Canadian dollar goes down, then the price of imports goes up. And that might be an important factor uh, affecting uh, some important food products that we consume and something for us to keep an eye on going forward as well. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, looking forward in, in the next week, we're going to be listening very closely to the Bank of Canada. And I'm wondering, so, hey, will today's number affect the decision out of the Bank of Canada? Because we've seen some very large rate hikes this past year already. Will the headline number give reason to continue that trend? Well, you know, uh, even with today's release, we're still, you know, sticking with a forecast of uh, the bank raising rates by 50 basis points uh, by the end of uh, this month. And to your point, Michael, we've already seen a lot of interest rate hikes this month. In fact, uh, the bank has raised the interest rate by 300 basis points in less than nine months. So, you know, my advice going forward would be, you know, for the bank to take it slow. Um, and if it has to raise rates, do it in an, it, it should do it in an incremental manner. Uh, because uh, we also need to keep in mind that interest rate hikes, they take about 18 to 24 months to be fully felt and absorbed by the whole economy. So if the bank overdoes things right now, it doesn't really have much of an option to fix things later except for you know uh, decreasing interest rates earlier than it had planned, and that would hurt its credibility and perhaps push inflation higher uh, even more. Well, was and, you know, the other benefit... Sorry to jump in. I, that was going to actually be my next question, though, Sohei, because there is so much focus right now on taming the inflation monster and by that raising interest rates uh, and really not letting inflation get out of control. I'm wondering, though, does the Bank of Canada potentially create more pain and dangerously too focused on inflation alone? Well, uh, you know, Michael, to answer this question, we also need some context, which is that uh, one of the reasons inflation is so high today is because of how late the Bank of Canada was in raising rates in the first place. Uh, the, you know, inflation was mischaracterized as being transitory, which meant that the bank only started to raise rates in March of this year. And remember, by March of this year, inflation was already above the Bank of Canada's upper target limit of 3% for around 12 months. Uh, but, you know, the risk of a recession is increasing, uh, which means that uh, I think the bank uh, will stop raising rates well before uh, it gets inflation anywhere close to its target range. In other words, uh, at least next year, uh, you know, the bank will be comfortable with inflation staying above its uh, target range. And if it does become, you know, if it does stay aggressive and if it does keep uh, raising rates to bring inflation within the target range, uh, then I think, you know, a deep recession uh, seems like a foregone uh, conclusion. When does it become better? Is it the spring that people can finally breathe again? Uh, what type of forecast are you giving here? Uh, Trevor, I'll begin with you. Sure. So I think it's important to recognize just the high level of uncertainty that still exists around the world. Supply chain disruptions continue to be uh, an issue. What goes on in China with respect to their zero COVID policy? That's important. What happens to global oil prices? Do they rise from here? Do they fall? So there's just many fundamentally unpredictable factors that would lead inflation to rise or fall. But if recent trends continue, then we would start to see that headline rate get closer to normal late spring, early summer next year. So, hey, what do you think? Well, Michael, it's, it's going to be a you know, dark and stormy winter for uh, for most Canadians. Uh, you know, we are forecasting for growth to become stagnant, at least until the first half of uh, next year. 
but we will start seeing the first rays of dawn hopefully by the second half of next year. Okay, well, we are watching very closely. The whole country is. Uh, Sohaib Shahid, thank you for that. Trevor Toom, thank you as well. Thank you both for your time today. Thank you. When the Liberals campaigned in the last election, they promised to bring in so-called anti-scab legislation, essentially putting an end to the use of replacement workers during labor disputes. Now, the initiative was given new life when the NDP made anti-scab legislation a condition of their confidence deal with the government. And today, NDP MP Alexandre Bouleris spoke as the Labor Minister announced a consultation process to get the legislation going. I'm really proud that the NDP, we put that in the agreement that we negotiated with the Liberal government. It's the step forward for the rights of the workers. It's a good thing for the future. I think it's a good thing for the economy in general. And uh, I'm I, I asking everybody who is uh, uh, interested to participate in those really important consultations, and we will see you know, a bill uh, uh, as soon as possible. Well, joining us now is the Labour Minister himself, Seamus O'Regan, who is also the MP for the riding of St. John's Mount Pearl. Minister, thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. Now, with the announcement, you, you will begin this consultation process on legislation that would essentially ban replacement workers. But I'm wondering, what exactly are you hoping to learn? Because Labour groups, they're very clear, they want this kind of protection and they want it as soon as possible. Yeah, uh, you know, the devil's in the details. And remember, these are tripartite negotiations, uh, you know, as they should be. Uh, so we're sitting down with businesses to, together to, to see, you know, we're, uh, what's the best way to go about this? I, I you know, in, in my tenure now of about one year as labor minister, I have become a big fan of the negotiating table. And the more that you can keep people focused on the negotiating t- table, the better. Um, you know, you, I, I'm not a bit, I'm in no way a big fan of back to work legislation or, um, you know, uh, other avenues that may, that may occur, even, you know, like replacement workers. Um, you want people's attention on the negotiating table. That's where the best deals are done. That's where the most durable deals are done. Um, and that's, you know, another big reason why we decided to go ahead with this. It was part of our platform in 2021, so it's not a surprise to anybody. Um, but, and it is also part of our agreement uh, after that with the NDP. Uh, this is something that we were planning on doing. People have known it's, it, it would come. Um, but I, I honestly see it as just kind of a, a, an evolution of, of workers' rights in this country that's been going on now for, you know, over 100 years. Um, you know, workers, when they come to the negotiating table, what their leverage is, is their work. Um, and uh, when, when you involve replacement workers, you are significantly taking away from that leverage that they have at the negotiating table. Okay. So, you know, this, I think, is, is brings us back to the table and back to what I think will be a level playing field. But I, I always preface it, that, you know, these, I do believe in consultations and I don't believe in, in, uh, in prejudicing them. So, you know, we'll see what comes out of them. Okay, see what comes out of them. The consultation will last until mid-December. Now, your commitment is to have uh, legislation, what, introduced or passed before the end of 2023? By the end of 2023, that's right. So, yeah. so passed yeah. or introduced? And- Introduced. Introduced, yeah. okay. Why not sooner, though? Because as I said, labor groups, uh, they've been pushing uh, the government to move forward with this ever since you made the commitment in the last election, ever since you made the deal with the NDP. The push has been on to have it before 2023, not just introduced, but passed. So why not sooner? Well, we're, we've also got a, a second track of what we call maintenance of activities negotiations. There may or may not become part of that legislation. We'll see... You know how that goes but basically we want to make sure that every avenue is exhausted before you get to a position where there's a work stoppage of any kind whether it's a strike or a lockout um you know a lot of what just to be clear for for your viewers i mean what we're talking about here uh, are the things that are within our jurisdiction my jurisdiction which is uh uh you know the private sector under federal regulation under federal jurisdiction um and that involves uh, a lot of transportation a lot of telecommunications um and and so you know in those areas we want to make sure particularly we affect it affects supply chains like railways airlines ports uh we want to make sure that we've exhausted absolutely av- every avenue that we can before we get to that 
that position before we get to a strike or, or a work stoppage of any sort. So that that's what maintenance of activities comes down to. It means that, you know, in certain circumstances, uh, that uh, both parties, both the employer and the employees, agree that okay, look, you know, while we're sitting at the negotiating table, we will make sure that these services continue for the greater good of Canadians, for the greater good of the Canadian economy. What does that look like? How can we make that faster? How can we make sure that you know again? Canadians are looked after. The economy is looked after. Employers and employees are looked after, uh, while you know, uh, while parties are sitting down at the negotiating table. So you you have both of these things happening, and consultations will occur on both of these, which may or may not both factor into the legislation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So so on the on the one hand, protecting workers; on the other hand, making sure that the economy is not negatively impacted from ah, them taking what you're saying from you. Absolutely. Does that mean that you're concerned about corporate pushback here? Well, we definitely want to hear them out. I, look, I, you know, I, I, I talk to employers as much as I talk to employees. I mean, maintaining that balance as a labor minister uh, is one of the reasons why we've had such success uh, over the course of the summer. I mean, just, uh, Michael, just, you know, when I came in and very very soon after I became labor minister, we had to deal with CP Rail, you'll recall. Um, we had a slight work stoppage there, but we, we got the deal done. But after that, I mean, I was looking looming coming into the summer, you know, CN, Via, Purolator, Loomis, WestJet, uh, you know, Bell. There were a whole host of, of deals, but some of them that I was you know, worried about in terms of supply chains and just, you know, making sure that the economy is OK. Um, uh, all parties came to an agreement there. Uh, we have I, I've had I've dealt with some amazing public servants in, in the portfolios I've held. But I got to tell you, the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, these guys, uh, are unbelievable. You mentioned the fact that this is a promise made by uh, your party in the last election campaign. It's also a, 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 a condition of your supply and confidence agreement with the NDP. Right. Would this initiative have happened without that NDP deal? Oh yeah, it's in our platform. We were, we were already set on doing it. Uh, you know, uh, before has this it been occurred, given, uh, has it been given greater priority because of the deal? Uh, no, I think it was it was right on course. We're exactly where we said we would be. But look, I'm very happy that it's uh, that we have the NDP support. And look, I'm I'm a big fan of the agreement that we have with the NDP. I work very closely uh, with my NDP colleagues on just transition, and and the changes to the you know to our energy uh, and and, to, and you know the transition of energy workers. I, I say transition, but really what we're talking about is lowering emissions and building up renewables. And we need them to do that. We need workers to do that. So I've been working with unions, but I'm working with my NDP colleagues on this as well. I'm happy that it's a shared priority. I'm, I'm happy to have their support. Uh, my critic for the NDP, Alexandre Boulouris, stood by my side during the press conference today in the National Press uh, Theater, mm-hmm. and uh, I was happy for uh, for I'm happy for his friendship and support. He is uh, he is definitely a harsh critic, um, but you know I was happy to have him with me because I know that this is something that he himself. Uh, as somebody who's been involved with the labor movement for some 20 years, this is uh, you know this is a big day for him. I think personally, I wanted to share it with. Him. Okay. Well, with that, I want to thank you for the time. Good to see you, Minister. Thank you for this. Thank you, Michael. A group of senators returned from the Arctic last week. All members of the Senate Committee on National Security, Defense, and Veterans Affairs, they went to see how prepared Canada is to defend its claims to the North and fend off threats that could challenge Canadian sovereignty. Senator Tony Dean took part in that tour. He joins us now. Senator Dean, thank you for joining us today. You're very welcome. Good to chat with you. Now, Arctic sovereignty, it's of course an issue that's been getting a bit more attention in recent years, but the Kremlin's illegal invasion of Ukraine, that really is giving the issue greater urgency. Uh, Having toured the region, how well equipped is this country to enforce sovereignty in the north? Well, I think we're doing well, Michael, but we can certainly do a lot better. Uh, We know that there are a number of threats uh, to the Arctic. Those have been described as um, those that that are direct threats to the Arctic, those that are in the Arctic, and those that are likely to be through the Arctic. Um, Certainly climate change is a, a threat to the Arctic. It's opening up waterways, as you know. It's going to affect traditional hunting and and fishing grounds for for the Inuit, and um, and it, it it is also creating the opportunity for other states, some of whom are not friendly to us, to um, uh, reach into the Arctic for mineral and fishing ex, uh, ex- exploration. 
And we know that um, Russia is, is an Arctic state and is in fact very close to us uh, in the Arctic and uh, they have been building up significant uh, defence uh, infrastructure there, submarine bases and, uh, and airfields and things of that nature. I also want to talk about, you know, a part of ensuring sovereignty is Canada's participation in NORAD when it comes to, to the Arctic. And the end of the Cold War yes. may have taken priority away from that defense line. But where do things stand there? The government is promising to make a huge reinvestment, but just how badly is investment needed into NORAD? Um, there are very significant needs in terms of new defense spending. And I think the you know, the government has has recognised that there's an initial um, multi-billion dollar spend in the in the next six years, and and a, a much larger, almost forty billion spend over the next twenty years, and I think that covers everything from basic infrastructure, from from airfields, runways, certainly uh, radar technology. We are now maintaining. Uh, old radar technology that will need to be replaced as a matter of urgency, and certainly as we, as we see the development of a new uh, generation of hyperkinetic uh, cruise missiles that um, may not be a threat directly to the Arctic, but might meet that criteria of being a threat that goes through the Arctic. So how important will be will your fact-finding mission be for the government uh, to inform its policy going forward in the north? Well, ve very uh, significant and impactful, I hope. When our committee was structured afresh in the new parliament, uh, this was the number one choice in terms of priorities for everyone on our committee. This was pre uh, invasion of uh, Russia, in invasion of Ukraine. I, I think that everybody on that committee was aware going in of the fragilities of the Arctic, of the fragilities of our defences, and and the muscularity of Russia in terms of starting to build out its military infrastructure in its part of the Arctic. So Canada's relationship with its U.S. Uh, colleagues is hugely important, as is investment in our own uh, defense and security infrastructure. Of course, when NORAD came to be, uh, when Canada kept uh, looked north to, to the Arctic, not a lot of respect was afforded uh, to Inuit leadership and knowledge. How does that get addressed in the process to come? Well, let me say this first and foremost. We met with Inuit leaders across the Arctic and they are an impressive group of leaders. There are lots of young leaders, uh, both um, in terms of on the business side and infrastructure development side. Um, they have appropriately an, an, an attitude and expectation of nothing about us without us. Uh, they are asking for consultation on all of the investments that are being made because, of course, they're interested in, yes, in the military and, and defense and security infrastructure, but the social and economic infrastructure that would be byproducts of that and very important byproducts of that. We're talking about roads, we're talking about clean energy, we're talking about clean water, and we're definitely talking about much better and more resilient broadband. So there is, a, there is an intense interest, um, a close eye on what uh, decisions are being made in Ottawa and a very significant expectation for engagement and voice in the process of how those investments are made and where they are made. Senator, really appreciate the time today. Thank you for being here. You're very welcome. Thanks, Michael. For nearly 30 years, Bill Blakey faithfully served as a member of Parliament. First elected in 1979 as an NDP MP for Manitoba, he left federal politics in 2008 and returned to Manitoba to run for election there. Bill Blakey died last month and today politicians of all stripes paid tribute, including his son Daniel Blakey who followed his father's footsteps and today serves in the House of Commons. A deeply valued tradition and family connection. 
Exploring and celebrating our Scottish and Irish heritage was one of the ways he connected to our family history. Growing up, Celtic music, stories, and toasts featured prominently in our family gatherings. But these things were also an important part of his public persona. The Democrats in Winnipeg have spent many evenings on a diet of Burns poetry and reflections on the state of democratic socialism in Canada <laughs> in order to support NDP MPs from Elma Transcona. In fact, the member for Burnaby South had the honor of being our guest speaker at just one such occasion. He and Tommy Douglas organized the first formal Burns dinners here on Parliament Hill, a tradition that was subsequently taken up by the speaker. These dinners have served as an opportunity for politicians of all stripes to gather and relate to each other in positive ways too often drown out by the more toxic personalities in the House of Commons. My sisters and I will be forever grateful for the many long conversations that lasted well into the wee hours of the morning when we got to investigate the mysteries of theology, politics, and history with a master of the arts that cared for us deeply. We love you too, Dad. Earlier I mentioned his fondness for Scottish culture, so I'd like to finish this tribute with one of his favorite Scottish toasts. Here's to us, was like us, damn few, and the raw deed. <laughs> And that is primetime politics for this evening. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Serapio. We'll see you again tomorrow.